forgiveness, brought the gift of the Spirit and the glory of God. In verse 4, we notice that Paul recognises the position of the evil one. He calls him, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. He saw that the evil one was the one who controlled this world. And he also controls the minds of unbelievers. You know, it's so hard often as we share the gospel with people and they just don't seem to understand, they just don't get it, do they? It's so clear to us, but so dim to them. And we know that's because the evil one has blinded their minds. And it's true that when we come to know God, our will and our emotions are also involved. But it's first in our minds that the key factors are as we think through the claims of Christ. It's a metaphor, but in verse 4, it does remind us that it's with the mind that we can see the light of the gospel. Seems strange, but just think for a minute. With our minds, we can see the light of the gospel. And with our minds, we can see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. And so Satan, with his understanding and knowledge of mankind, has blinded the mind of man. Times of discouragement come to everybody. Perhaps in whatever our ministry is, doesn't just mean full-time ministry, it's whatever we're doing in serving God, the devil will be at us. And there's always the temptation just to give up. It'd be easier just to give up and not follow on. But we do well to say with Paul, since we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Our problem is that we look in, we look around, but what we need to do is to look up it's to God himself we turn and have our eyes refocus, not on the problems, not on our discouragements, but on him. And so first of all, he wouldn't give up because of the divine commission. And then secondly, because of the power within us, verses 7 to 9. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We're hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. He talks about having this treasure in jars of clay. Here Paul contrasts a priceless jewel with an everyday earthen jar. Now in these days, people would have understood what he was talking about. Because in their homes, they had all kinds of jars, very ornate and beautiful ones in the, where you would have your visitors. But you go through to the kitchen, just be ordinary pots, just earthenware pots, easily broken, no value, but just that they could be used. And so it is. The jewel or the treasure that Paul is talking about is the knowledge of God in the face of Christ, which God has made to shine in our hearts. Isn't it wonderful that God has done that for us? That he has shone his light and we can see the treasure of the gospel. The earthen jar in which it's contained is our human body, subject to decay and vulnerable to disease. In other words, the body in itself is powerless. So the treasure that, God, that Paul had received, the ministry of the gospel, was a ministry of life and power and glory. And that ministry God has given to us, intentionally weak, powerless people, not accidental, but deliberate. Why? Verse 7. To show that this all-surpassing power is from God. The power to lift man out of his powerlessness in the face of suffering, decay and death doesn't come from within. It only comes from God. If we could do it, God wouldn't have to, but we can, and so he has. We're like a jar of clay in order that the all-surpassing power might be from God and not from ourselves. 
Earlier on in, in verse 8 of chapter 1, Paul had written of being under pressure far beyond our ability to endure. Now, in exact answer to that, he talks of God's power, which surpasses the weakness of the human body. And the more we feel pressure, the more we feel pressure, we need to ask God to use it to press us close to him. It's part of God's plan that his power is the one that's going to be used. Human life is short, it can be destroyed in a second. It's an earthenware jar, a, a cheap clay pot, but the powers of God. A commentator writes, the immense discrepancy between the treasure and the vessel simply serves to show that human weakness presents no barrier to the purposes of God. In fact, in chapter 12 and verse 9 it says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So don't worry when you feel weak. That's when God's power is so wonderfully displayed. Isn't it really encouraging? It doesn't depend on us at all, but it depends on him. It's not about me, what I think or feel or think I can do. It's all about him. He's made us as we are so he can work through us that his power may be obvious to all. So why do we get discouraged and want to quit the fight? God takes the circumstances in which we find ourselves, hard as they are, and makes them occasions for showing more of his glory. Paul was so overwhelmed by this thought that he would not give up. <clears throat> and then thirdly, what reason else does he have? Going on in 8 to 15, because of blessing in the lives of others. Paul is very honest here. He doesn't cover up his difficulties as one conscious of being a jar of clay. He tells us something about his sufferings and hardships. Most of these problems arose from his calling, but many of us can identify with his feelings. We as ordinary people can be encouraged to know the Apostle Paul shared our difficulties. But I want you to look at verses 8 and 9, because along with each problem, there was a but not. Pressured, but not crushed. Distressed, but not in despair. Hounded, but not abandoned. Depressed, but not destroyed. The but nots are so important, aren't they? True, there was all these things, but it wasn't being a lethal, lethal blow. If the fourfold difficulties show he's a jar of clay, the fourfold but nots show that the all-surpassing power is from God. It seems probable in each of his seemingly hopeless situations that Paul would have prayed for help and identified his problem to God in prayer. Then as the answer came, he could say, but not. And so seeing these four but nots encourages us to pray about our own areas of stress or difficulty. I wonder this morning, what is the but not for you? 